<clears throat> All right, well, this morning we're going to be looking, as I've said, at one of the more difficult sayings of our Lord Jesus. I've already given you some explanation perhaps to head off questions this may rise, but, or that may raise, be raised from this, but we're going to uh, look at it more carefully and deal with that as we go through it. Uh, we're going to be looking just at the first three verses of this text, but I would like to read the whole thing just for the, the whole impact of it. So we'll look at the first three verses this morning, we'll look at the balance of it this evening, and I would encourage you, if you're able to, to come this evening to, to see the conclusion of this as well. But this is what we read in Luke 14, beginning in verse 25. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, again, our Lord says many things in this passage. We, we don't have time to look at all of them this morning, so we're going to deal just with the first three verses, which are quite full and quite challenging. So may the Lord, again, use this uh, not to, of course, tear us down, but rather to build us up and to give us guidance and direction where we need to go, what direction we need to go in our lives, whether it be to Christ to come to know Him to begin with or whether it be to come to Christ that He might strengthen that love that's in our hearts so that we might honestly say we do love Him more than these others. Now, Luke tells us that having finished uh, teaching the Pharisees as we saw over the past two Lord's Days, and I'm going to say this just to remind us, we have been looking at different things that we do need to remember. Okay, he spoke to them regarding the Sabbath, you know, that there is a Sabbath, that we need to, to rest on the Sabbath, we need to give that day to Him, and we need to keep the other commandments and help those who are in need on that day. Regarding humility and servanthood, I've already reminded, uh, again, all of us this morning, that it's the one who humbles himself to become the slave and servant of all that is greatest in the kingdom. Uh, regarding caring for the poor, when we throw a banquet or a feast, don't just keep inviting the people that you customarily invite in the hopes that they're going to invite you in return, but instead invite those who can't repay you, invite those who are in need. And then last, uh, last we saw the desire they needed to have to enter into the kingdom. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven, one said. And then Jesus said, that's true, but you're not going to be one of them, Okay because you don't desire the kingdom. You desire a political kingdom. You don't desire the spiritual kingdom that I came to bring. You need to desire that most of all. Well, having concluded that particular uh, luncheon, Jesus continued toward Jerusalem, and that's really where he's been heading for the past couple of chapters, where he would celebrate his final Passover and fulfill its meaning by offering himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, Luke tells us that as he was traveling, there was a large crowd that followed him. And this reminds us of, of something very important that we don't want to miss because as we're looking at the reaction of the Jews, sometimes we see you know, Jews following him and being interested in him even while he's heading toward Jerusalem, even in the last days. But yet in other cases, we find Jews who hate him and want to kill him. So why does that happening? Well, because 
those who were in Jerusalem were the ones who wanted to kill him. The Jews everywhere else didn't have as big of a problem with him, except, of course, the leaders in the synagogues when Jesus would step on their toes by telling them the truth. But for the most part, he was popular outside of Jerusalem. And we see that at being still in Galilee, there were still many Jews who were following him. But the point we want to see here is that these people, these Jews, were following him for differing reasons. Okay, they were a mixed crowd in the same way the churches today, we have to assume, according to what Jesus tells us, are mixed congregations. Okay? They're following for differing reasons. That's what Jesus means when he says it will be a mixture of wheat and tares. There will be those who love him, and there will be those who are basically there for other reasons. Now, some of these were following Jesus because like the man who called out, blessed are those who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but that he was a political Messiah who was shortly going to deliver the Jews from the Romans. Others were following Jesus because obviously Jesus was unique. He was exciting. I mean, things like this didn't happen all the time, right, in Palestine. Uh, not much out of the ordinary usually took place, but here was one who taught with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. Here is one who could command sickness, and those who were sick would be made well, who could command the demons, and they would come out of the demon-possessed, and who could even command the dead to be raised again to life. Jesus was unique, and he was exciting. But there were also those who were following him for the right reasons. And that was because they loved him. They loved him because they were born again by the Spirit of God. You know, the Lord, the Father had, had changed their hearts and he was drawing them to Jesus. Well, Jesus knew they were a mixed crowd. And so as they were walking along, Jesus turns to them and he begins to sort them out, okay? Remember what John the Baptist said about the ministry that Jesus was going to have when he came? In Luke 3, actually, in verse 17, he says this, His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, what Luke was telling us here is that, actually, I believe this is a quote from John the Baptist, that Jesus was coming to basically winnow Israel, to winnow, to sort out basically the wheat from the tares, those who belonged to him from those who didn't. And the way that he would do it was by preaching his word, by preaching the truth so that those who heard would basically respond and it would become clear what was in their hearts. And they could see for themselves what was in their hearts. Now, I think that that's how we should view what Jesus is telling us here. Jesus is not giving us a list of things that we need to be able to produce or work up in ourselves this kind of love before we can be his disciples, before we can come to him. You know, love me most of all, and if you do, then when you come to me, I will save you. That's not what he's saying. Rather, he's telling us what must be true of us if we are to be his disciples, if we are being drawn by the Father. Now, let me just make one note of clarification here that a disciple, what Jesus is talking about here, is not as many you know, churches believe today, it is not a higher level of Christianity, a deeper level of commitment that the Lord would require from some uh, more than perhaps all of his people who are actually saved. A disciple is simply another way of saying Christian. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be one of mine, if you're going to follow me, remember what Luke says in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So Christians are disciples, disciples are Christians. That's what Jesus is talking about here. What he is saying is, this is what will be in your hearts. If you are true believers, okay, if you are Christians. And by the way, that's, that's nothing new, right? That's something we're used to hearing. The Reformers said the same thing when they said this. Salvation is a free gift. By God's grace alone, 
received through faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. It is always accompanied by good works, and they would also say works that are motivated by this kind of love. So what is Jesus telling us here that we should find in our hearts if we truly belong to him? Well, he says that we should love him, okay? Love him more than anyone. Love him more than our life. Love him more than our comforts. Now, first of all, he tells us that we should love him more than anyone else. He says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. Now, notice he uses the word hate rather than loving less. We need to come to grips with what he's talking about here. Now, is Jesus really telling us here? that we literally need to hate those who are closest to us? Well, he can't mean that because Jesus commands us actually to love these people. He's telling us here that we need to hate. And I think it would be good for us to review that, right? Now, he says, first of all, we need to hate our father and mother. But doesn't Jesus tell us that we are to love our parents, right? No matter how old we get as children, no matter how old our parents get, uh, he tells us in the fifth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, you know what? The word honor does not exclude love. It actually includes love, doesn't it? The word honor means to respect. It means to regard. It means to see someone as having value. You know, when we hate somebody, we basically don't see any value in that person. So this is the opposite of that. Our Lord tells us to love our parents. And how can we, as husbands, hate our wives when Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her? And how can you, wives, hate your husbands or how can we as parents hate our children when Paul says to Titus in Titus 2, verses 3 through 4, young women are to love their husbands and to love their children. I mean, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. That certainly includes everyone. That includes brothers and sisters. It includes all of our neighbors. It includes even our enemies. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses 44 through 45, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So can we hate these? Is Jesus telling us that we need to hate these people? Well, obviously not. So then what is he talking about when he says that unless we do this, we cannot come to him? Well, obviously he means by comparison, right? We must love them. We just read, Jesus tells us, we must love them all. But we must love them less than him. Hatred simply emphasizes how much less we are to love them and how much more we are to love him. Okay, we are to love them far less than we love him. Now, what this tells us is that there is a priority to love. And that's not really so strange because, you know, the Bible tells us as well that there, there is a priority also to the commandments, to the commandments of God, right? There, there are times when some of the commandments are actually suspended in order that we might keep other of the commandments Again, if you've ever asked yourself the question, would it have been right or wrong for Corrie Ten Boom to lie to the, to the Nazi soldiers who came to her door asking her if there were any Jews in her household, would it have been wrong for her to tell a lie under those circumstances? Well, if we would say yes to that, we would also have to say it was also wrong for Rahab to have lied regarding where the uh, spies were that came into her house, which she was hiding on the roof, and to tell the soldiers who came in after them that they actually left and have crossed the ford and have gone that direction. And yet we see that the Lord blessed her 
because she actually did this. There is a hierarchy in the commandments. Well, there's also a priority or a hierarchy when it comes to love. Sometimes obeying Jesus may mean that we have to lay aside, at least temporarily, what love dictates we would do for others that we also love, such as our families. Have you ever asked yourself the question, how could Peter leave his, his wife? I mean, Peter was obviously married. He had a mother-in-law. How could he leave his wife and his mother-in-law for three and a half years while he traveled around with Jesus? There's a priority that's involved here. How could James and John basically abandon their father Zebedee in the family business to go follow Jesus for that same period of time? It's because Jesus called them and their love for Jesus demanded that they put him and his requirements first. Now, thankfully, if our loved ones are also believers, there should rarely be a conflict between loving Jesus and loving them because we're all going to be putting Jesus' concerns first. This is much more likely to happen when our family members, or at least among the family members who do not believe. Do I have to tell you that? I mean, that we know that to be true. Jesus told us as much in Matthew 10 in our reading earlier in verses 34 through 37. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus is telling us here that if following him puts us at odds with our family, if it drives a wedge between us and our parents, between us and our spouses, between us and our children, we need to love him enough to be willing to pay that price. We must love him more than we love them, okay? Now, secondly, he says we must love him more than life. He says in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, again, we know Jesus does not mean this literally, Paul reminds us that there isn't a person alive who hates his own life. Remember what he says to the husbands in Ephesians 5, verses 28 through 30? And again, who can really do this but somebody who is born again by the Holy Spirit? So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. Nobody hates himself, okay? So Jesus can't literally be meaning that. He knows we love ourselves too much. Now, what about those that um, commit suicide? Do they hate themselves so much that they've destroyed themselves? Well, you know, I think it's been, it's been said whether it's been proven or not, I don't know, but I think it must, if, if what Jesus says here is true uh, through the Apostle Paul, we know it must be true, they didn't kill themselves because they hated themselves. They actually killed themselves because they loved themselves too much to allow themselves to continue to suffer. And they thought by taking their lives, they would actually put an end to the suffering. But we know in, in virtually all cases, maybe most cases, that will not be true. But our Lord tells us, in case we might think that is the case, we are not to take our own lives when he says, you shall not murder. And when he says that, he doesn't mean that, merely, that we are not merely not to take the lives of others unjustly, but we are not to take our own lives. We are to protect our lives, and we actually do protect our lives. We do not hate ourselves. That's not what Jesus is telling us, that we need to hate ourselves and somehow desire our own deaths. What he means is, again, by comparison, we need to love ourselves and our own lives less than how much we love him. The hatred that we are to display towards our own lives emphasizes how much less, far less, okay? We love him far more. We love our lives far less, which means we must be willing to die 
if that's what Jesus calls us to do. Now, does Jesus ever do that? I mean, doesn't health and wealth and abundant living teach us that that's not what Jesus calls us to do? Well, that's what they teach, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, yes, sometimes he actually does do this. I mean, wasn't he the one who called Paul to lay down his life? And wasn't Paul willing to do that because he loved him? Remember uh, when Agabus came to Paul and he took his, his belt and he basically wrapped it around himself and he said, the one who owns this belt is going to be bound in Jerusalem, is going to be delivered over to the Gentiles and, and essentially, you know, that means, means his life is going to be put into peril. And Luke and the others, when they heard Agabus, they began begging Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. But Paul says in Acts 21, 13, what are you doing? Weeping. And breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, Paul was eventually called by our Lord to lay down his life and to be martyred, but his heart was, I love him so much, I am willing to give my life for him. The author to the Hebrews tells us, you know, we look at Hebrews chapter 11 and we see all those glorious stories about faith and how those who had faith and trusted God did such great things. But towards the end of the chapter, it begins to transition from those who conquered kingdoms to those who were sawn in two and who were put to death by the sword and who were in prison and lived in holes and caves and you know, so forth. Uh, there were many who laid down their lives because of their love for the Lord. And they didn't do that accidentally. That was a part of God's plan. And they were willing to submit to it because they loved Him. Same thing is true throughout the history of the church. I mean, especially during the time of the Reformation. Think about John Huss, pre-Reformation. William Tyndale, during the Reformation. Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridby, uh, excuse me, Ridley, and John Frith. What do they all have in common? They would not compromise the gospel, and they were all burned at the stake. Okay, they loved the Lord and His truth enough to lay down his life. By the way, a host of people laid down their lives for the gospel. Fox's Book of Martyrs, not just that little thin volume, you know, that is sold in the Christian bookstores that tells you about a few of the people that die. Fox's Acts and Monuments is a huge collection, of basically, you know, a chronology of all the suffering and death that those who love the Lord went through because they had to for his sake and they were willing to do that. Now, Even if the Lord does not actually call us to lay down our lives for Him, this is the kind of heart that Jesus says that we have to have within ourselves to be His disciples. And let me just say, even if we don't particularly feel like dying today, that doesn't mean that if you belong to Him, that you won't have the strength you need when that time actually comes. If you have the Spirit of God, you do have this love. And finally, He says, we have to love Him more than our comforts. Verse 27, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, carrying the cross has the idea of dying to self, putting aside our goals, putting aside our aspirations, if those things happen to be other than what the Lord wants us to do, and being willing to bear with the difficulties that following Jesus will inevitably bring into our lives. Remember what we just sang? Bring grief and pain. Uh, that is going to come if we follow Jesus. There's going to be difficulties, and we need to be willing to bear those things. Now, Jesus is, again, not telling us that we can't pursue certain goals. They do need to be His goals. They do need to be open to revision. There are people, you know, who set off in one direction, and the Lord, you know, lets them go that way for a while, and they pursue this career. And then the Lord says, I want you to change. I want you to go this direction now. We need to be willing to do that, right? He's not telling us here that we can't recreate, that we can't do things that are relaxing, that are fun, go on vacations, but we can't live for those things. They can't be our lives. He's not telling us that we have to give those things up, but He is telling us that following Him is going to be very, very hard. It's going to be very, very difficult because we're not only going to have to face the personal battles of letting go of what we might have wanted out of this life when we started, if what we wanted was wrong, 
We're also going to have to face again the grief, the pain, the difficulties, the sufferings. Among them, the hostility of a world that hates the Lord, right? John writes in 1 John 3.13, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Jesus said the same thing too. The world hated me. It's also going to hate you. Why is it going to hate you? Because you're like Jesus, right? They hated Jesus because Jesus was like Jesus. If you become like Jesus... They're going to hate you too because they do not love what true love and holiness is actually all about. We'll likely lose friends, perhaps the love of family members. We might even lose positions that we might otherwise have had. Do you know that J. Gresham Machen, the man who's really looked to in this denomination as the, the father of, uh, of this particular denomination, uh, he wasn't given a, a particularly important chair uh, at Princeton Seminary, and that would be the chair of the New Testament department. And the reason was because he didn't sign a particular document that was a, a, a compromising document that basically said that the fundamentals of the Christian faith are only certain theories. They're not really what the Bible teaches alone. They're just certain theories about what the Bible teaches, and there are other theories that could equally explain what the Bible is teaching. Machen said, this is the gospel. I'm not going to compromise. And they said, well, fine then. We're not going to give you this chair. And that's one of the reasons why they started Westminster Seminary in, in Philadelphia is because of this reorganization and the removal of those who actually believe the Bible in that way. So it can cost you dearly, but as we know, it also pays dividends because he, he got a better position. They started a better seminary that continues to, again, uphold the truth of the fundamentals uh, to this day. He may call us to missionary work in a very primitive land, <laughs> which means that we would have to give up pretty much all of our comforts all at once, as, as well as all of our family members and those who are close to us and all the things we enjoy in order to go and to endure hardship on that field. The question is, do we love Him enough, you know, to be able to give those things up and go? Now, I'm sure that as I've been going through this, all of us have been asking the question, do we really love the Lord that much, right, to give up, put Him before all, all of our family members and friends, to put Him before our lives, to put Him before the things that we enjoy doing in this world and our comforts and recreations in order to bear difficulty and even the vision and strife and put our lives at peril? Do we really love Him that much? How can we love Him that much? Well, the first thing we need to see in closing again here is a little bit more application. We can't do this by nature. We can't do this as we come into the world apart from the grace of God. Because as we come into the world, we do not love Him at all. As a matter of fact, we side with those who crucified Him. We hate Him. We love these other things more and we will always put them before Him. We are just the opposite of what He calls us to be. We can't do it, again, in our own strength. But we can do it by His grace. And let me just remind you again, Jesus is not telling us that this is what we have to work up in ourselves by nature in order to be saved. He's simply telling us that this is what will be true of us if we are saved. So he's challenging us to look into our hearts and to see if that love is actually there. If we find it within ourselves, then we can know that we are his disciples we can know that we are saved. We can know we belong to Him. If we can't find it, then we still need the work of His Holy Spirit, the saving work of His Holy Spirit. We still need to come to Jesus Christ. As the Philippian jailer who asks, Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But now here's a, probably a more practical question for most of us here this morning. What if we find that we do love Him? And we do really love Him for the right reasons, that He is holy and righteous, and we actually see His glory and beauty, and we have trusted Him. But when we compare ourselves to what Jesus is saying here, we, we say, I'm not sure that I really love Him that much, maybe not nearly that much. Well, if that's what we discover, then I guess we could say in a certain, you know, in a certain sense, welcome to the club, because that's what all of us here are experiencing to one degree or another. 
because it is true of each of us that we struggle in this area. Jesus wants us to know, as the Puritans would tell us, that if we love Him at all, then we do belong to Him, even if there's just a little bit of love. Because, you know, that love can grow stronger or weaker depending upon many things. It doesn't have to be to the superlative in order for us to know that we are saved. If we have any of that love in our hearts at all, it can only be there because the Spirit of God has actually quickened us to life. And if He has, we're safe. We are His, and we will always be safe. But at the same time, our Lord Jesus is challenging us through this text not to let our love remain simply just barely hanging on, right? He wants us to grow to this degree. Now, this doesn't happen automatically. We do need to do something when it comes to sanctification, remember? I mean, what is the difference between a person who's just beginning in their sanctification and a person who has reached perhaps as much as you humanly can in this life? What's the difference between them? Well, their likeness, you know, their conformity to the image of Jesus, but ultimately, what is it that causes that? It's how much they love Him, okay? So, there is growth. There is room for improvement. And this is something that we're involved in. Remember, it's, it's sanctification. Regeneration, the new birth, is something God does sovereignly, you know, by His, His own will and His sovereign power. But sanctification is something we are involved in. We need to be putting to death our sins. We need to be putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not happen automatically. We need to do what our Lord tells us we must do in order to grow in this love. By the way, one of the things I've already told you is something He does. He sends the trials. He sends the difficulties. He sends the challenges and the tests. And those are all geared to help us love Him more. But there is something we can do also to cause this love to grow, and that is we need to draw near to Him. There's no substitute for that. And those trials and those tests are meant to get us to do that. So as long as we stand apart from the Lord, as long as we stand at a distance, as long as we're not seeking Him and drawing near to Him, we are always going to struggle with weak affections with a weak love. But the more time we spend with Him, the more we worship Him, the more we read His Word, the more we put it into practice, the more we pray, the more we fellowship with His people, not, not just, again, talking about the world, but talking about the things of the Lord and our ministering to one another, and the more we walk in obedience to Him, the stronger our love is going to be. Every time we compromise in these areas, we are pulling the plug and we are growing weaker and we know we are because we know where we always end up when we separate ourselves from these things and compromise. We know where we end up and that is not a good place to be. But we also know where we end up when we walk with Him, when we spend time with Him, when we worship Him, when we pray, when we read, when we do the things He calls us to do, we end up where we want to end up. Now, we might be in difficult circumstances if we follow the Lord in this way, but we have the strength to deal with those circumstances. If we go the other direction, we'll end up in difficult circumstances as well with no strength to be able to deal with those things. Which situation would you rather be in? Wouldn't you rather love your Lord? Well, that's what He wants us to do. So if we are to benefit at all from anything we've just heard, we need to set our hearts to do what we've just heard. Now, I'm, I'm sure that I haven't told you perhaps anything you haven't already known. The difference between benefiting or not benefiting is being a doer of the Word and not mere, merely a hearer only. We need to put these things into practice. So let's purpose, to hold on to what we've heard, spend time with Him, and walk with Him, draw near to Him, until our love is as strong as Jesus tells us it really needs to be, to be His disciple. May the Lord give us His grace. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us.